In case you're wondering who he is, his name is Jesse. Jesse is the videographer who comes every Sunday wherever I am and records the sermon, which, ne which means I can never repeat my sermons ever. <laughs> so if somebody comes up and says, well, I, did you preach that like three years ago when you were here? Hopefully I can say no. <laughs> this is a funny day. Not funny ha-ha, as in funny, more like funny odd. Odd because there are all of these contradictory things bumping up against each other. On the one hand, it's Christmas lights, it's candles, it's the joy of baptism, it's thinking about the coming season of Christmas where without apology and with great joy, we echo the word of the angels. Behold, I bring you good tidings with great joy which shall be for all people. And we say, Merry Christmas. And it's just, it's great fun. As it should be. Even there's a little echo in the scripture where Paul says, he talks about having real joy based on the God of hope who is at work in our heart and our lives. Bringing us joy because in the midst of Life, which can often feel like this juxtaposing battle, God, through his Son, promises that he will never leave us, that he will be with us always, and that there is meant to be for us a sense of joy in the very companionship of Christ. That we belong, we're not sort of duking it, this out on our own out down here, but we really are asking for God to work something in us. In fact, in essence, that's the heart of what's happening, both in baptism and confirmation. We're, we're actually believing that what the Lord will do in and through these meager and yet wondrous sacraments is that he will work a change in our hearts. The same is true in terms of receiving the Eucharist. It is the work of the Eucharist when we receive it, when we ingest the bread and the wine, that we're not just sort of eating something for a couple of minutes and then going back and sit, sitting down. Instead, we actually have the nerve to believe that when we receive those things, through the very gifts of the bread and wine and our prayers together, God actually breaks in here and does something that we need for him to do, which is confirm his presence, reaffirm who we are as those whom he has chosen to be his own. But the promise of the gospel is not just that we're the recipients of all of that great love and joy. The other piece of that is that things have to happen in us for us to be able to receive them. It's, it's like the Christmas carol, let every heart, you know it, let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing joy to the world. In other words, there's something inside of us that needs to be readjusted to make room for this kind of transcendent and eternal, ineffable joy. And that's really the heart of this Sunday. It's not just that life's great and we're really grateful and we're looking forward to Christmas. It actually is the declaration that there are things both in our life, in our culture, and in our world that are profoundly not right. And that's what repentance is. Repentance at its very heart, let me show you. If I say I repent of a bad behavior and I'm continuing to do the bad behavior and I'm saying I repent, I repent, but I'm still doing the bad behavior, something's not right about that picture. The assumption in the mouth of John the Baptist when he comes and he says repent, is the word repent literally means to turn. In other words, I'm going this way, and if I'm repenting, I'm actually turning away from that bad behavior and moving in a different direction. That's the heart of what repentance means. It actually means change. But, and this is why, if you'll notice in the service, and all of these people are making extraordinary commitments. They always will say, I will, what? With God's help. Because more often than not, the traps that we feel 
that cause us to go in the wrong direction are things that feel beyond our capacity to change. And therefore, we have to, with God's help, say, Lord, I need you to work that change in me, to give me the capacity to actually be able to turn and go in a different direction. I acknowledge the fact that there are parts of my life that don't line up with the scripture at all, and if the scripture is your revealed word, then I'm accountable to it. So I need to figure out, Lord, please show me what to do. Work the changes in me so that I can look more like what the liturgy says I am rather than all that I know myself to be within my own heart. That's what takes us into this path called repentance. And that's really the heart of Advent. This call to get ready, because the king is coming, who is literally, as you see so laid out in the scripture, going to be the judge of the whole earth. It's not going to be just this little private affair where God comes and deals with Christians. It's going to be all of us. The promise is for a new heaven and a new earth. The wolf shall lie down with the kid, it says says in the book of Isaiah. All flesh shall see it together. So we are here saying, Lord, I know it's coming. I don't know when it is. But you've already come once in your son Jesus. You promised to come back. That's what we say in the creeds. So I want you to do the work in my heart needed so that I can be about this kind of preparation. So that I can not only be changed, but actually be a channel for that kind of change in the places where you have put me. So it's not just that you're bringing peace in my heart and that means I feel better. Just like you prayed and we sang at the very beginning, that I actually It can be a channel that God uses to bring peace into the relationships that are around me, in the people that I know and care about, in the community in which I serve. As I said to those who are being confirmed, confirmation, and many of you have already been confirmed, is actually a commitment to do something. It's not just committing yourself to a certain set of things that you say you believe. It actually is, in fact, meant to create a change of life. That you are willing, I will, with God's help, take on the promises that you are making to be this channel that God uses in the places where you serve. Your family, your friends, your neighbor, your community. In other words, it's a commitment to service, which is why we're called servants, because servants are people who do something for the one they serve. You don't just sort of sit around and say, yeah, you're the, you're the king and I'm not. The king has things for us to do. So all of that is the heart of what we are trying to do here in Advent. Now the, the wonder of it, and this is what I love, is that there are two things that the scripture says to us this morning, and it really comes out of Paul's lesson to the Romans, that we need to heed if we're going to work this out. What, and it has everything to do with the last verse that was read. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. First of all, God is described as the God of hope. What that means is, we know we can hope in God. It's not an empty commitment. He's made these commitments to us, we've made these commitments to him, and we have hope that he is at work in our lives and that he's at work in the world. And how do we know that? Because he has already acted in sending his son, in sending the prophets, in bringing us to this place where we are in our lives right now. That God is, in fact, at work. And so I'm not just out there on my own trying to make something happen. I'm actually, in fact, being asked to join in the work that God is already doing. And the hope that we have is that there is this congruence between that which God is doing, that which we're attempting, in a way that actually makes a difference. Because the God of hope is saying, you're at work, and I'm putting my hand of blessing on it. I belong to you, and you belong to me. And it is exactly that kind of companionship in the work that gives 
the sense of joy. It means our life has an eternal purpose. It means we're not just out here sort of trying to figure it out and doing whatever we want to do. No, actually, if I'm a servant, my life is not my own. I don't get to call the shots. The actual, actually, the real story is I'm here to do the will of him who sent me. That's a part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, is that we are followers of Jesus. We look to him. And the promise is, is that as we begin to act in that manner, there's a joy that pours into our lives because it tells us that our life has eternal significance. That I'm not just battling it out from day to day, but in ways that sometimes I see, but more often times I don't see, that God is at work doing something that is eternally important. And it is that sense of purpose that sense that I'm a part of something that's far bigger than me. It expands the whole planet. It's bigger than space and time itself. It is the very nature of God. And I get to be a part of that. That's the joy. It doesn't mean that life is easy. Actually, just the opposite. This is a costly life. It's a life that demands everything. Because it is, willing, it is your willingness and mine to be available wherever we are, to be channels of that kind of peace and reconciliation. The willingness to serve when we would rather take. The capacity to give and forgive when in fact what we really want to do is sock them in the mouth. The willingness to be able to speak truth even in ways that are profoundly uncomfortable and to be subject to that truth yourself. Because if you're not bending the knee to that truth, you have no right to say it to anybody else. It's hard. But at the same time, it's worth it. It is that which brings us joy. That's why Paul says, because see, Romans, the Roman church is in big time conflict. Jewish converts in Rome who have come to Christianity, Gentile converts from paganism and polytheism have joined together in one fellowship and they don't get along. Too many differences in customs, traditions, and backgrounds. They, fight, they are fighting with each other and it is in that situation that Paul is calling them to work together so that together you may with one voice Glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ welcomed you. Who's he talking about? Oh, those people over there that I don't like. That's who he's talking about. That's what's going on in Rome. Because he knows that we have a witness to make to the world. And that witness is, is that our common what we share together, the place that brings us joy is not based on race, it's not based on education, it's not based on common cultural backgrounds. In fact, we look more like Jesus than ever when we are very different from one another, and yet what we have in common is this common commitment to serve the one who loved and gave himself for us. The world takes, sits up and takes notice of that in a way that is not true when we all look just like each other. We might as well be a club. Jesus didn't come to make a club. Jesus came to save us from every tribe, tongue, language, people, and nation so that in a united way in the midst of a divided world, as you know, growing more divided by the minute, we might be a group of people who says it is... What God has done in us that is binding us together. And we want to be a sacrament of that kind of unity, even in the midst of the heightening divisions in our world. We become that place where, as Jesus said, I was naked and you clothed me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was in prison and you came to see me. I was sick and you visited me. Even if it is, as Jesus says, the least of these. Because it is in the sight of God that all people matter. It is in the sight of God that we have been made in his image to stand together under the authority of Christ and to live out that kind of unity with each other. And that's why we say, well, I'll do it, but I need God's help to do that. Because it goes against all of our own selfishness. So what we're doing today is not small stuff. It's big. As I said to this group, I think what you're doing is courageous. 
because it will require courage. It will require public and not just private witness. It will require a capacity to work out our differences in a way that really does look like Jesus. It will require the very best of us, and yet God is at work. And being a part of that joy is what makes Advent, repentance, and the commitments that we will make today even possible. We need God's help to do this. So, when I'm, wa- I'm going to walk over there, we're going to start the baptism and the confirmation service. I hope you're praying like crazy for these people who are going to come up. And for yourself, that you might say, God, I want to join with them and be a part of what you're doing in the world. I want my life to count. I want a life that has eternal significance. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I thank you that in deep, deep humility, you came into our world as one despised so that we would despise no one. You came as an outcast so that in this church, O Lord, there would be none who would feel outcast. You came as one who had submitted yourself fully to the will of his Father. May we be a band of people who fully submit ourselves to your will as our Father, who loves us with great love and sent his Son to die and bring forgiveness. So, Lord, continue to cleanse our hearts. Continue to make room in us for that which you want to work both in us and through us, that we might walk with poise, with humility, and with joy, that we might be a channel of what it is that you are doing. We do place ourselves and one another in your hands, and we thank you. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.